Hello, everyone. Thanks all for joining um, our latest webinar on the GLUE API Gateway. Um, in this session, we're going to cover the latest enhancements in the 1.5 release. A uh, couple of housekeeping items. This session is being recorded, so we'll send out the recording and the slides um, by, by tomorrow at the latest, everyone who's registered. Um, and you're free to, uh, free to share that with your colleagues. Um, we will be doing uh, questions, um, handling questions for the session. So please go ahead and type them into the Q&A window or the chat window as we go along. Um, you know, we've got, we've got some slides for you today as well as a couple of demos. And then what we'll do is we'll answer those questions at the very end. Um, we'll kind of, so keep, keep entering them in as we go. For today, um, my name is Betty Janad. You all have probably heard me on uh, uh, previous webinars. Uh, I run marketing here at Solo. And today we are joined by two of our leads from the engineering team. We have Kevin DeRoche for Glue API Gateway and Marco Schmidt, who leads the development for the developer portal. Um, and to kick off um, a little bit about Solo, uh, we build API infrastructure to help handle the application network from the edge um, to the service mesh from the edge um, with Glue Gateway. That also includes federation and a developer portal from the service mesh um, for the service mesh hub and then to extend the application network with WebAssembly hub. And today we're going to focus specifically on Glue. And why glue? Um, why do we need this? Um, as we look at the uh, migration from monolithic um, application architecture to microservices, the network between the services becomes even more critical. So, uh, you know, instead of having one um, mega code base, we now have, you know, potentially hundreds or thousands of little services and they're all connected and how they talk and communicate with each other is through um, the APIs and whether the, um, the APIs are to expose them, expose the services to each other so they can communicate or expose them to the outside world so that um, people or other systems um, outside of your uh, environment can access those access your um, applications. Now, once you do that, the question, new questions arise and, you know, how do you manage those APIs? How do you enforce security as well as get observability into what's happening um, within the traffic and um, those connections? And that's really the purpose um, behind the Glue, Glue API Gateway and Ingus controller. It's, um, it's a next generation gateway and it's built with Envoy Proxy specifically to handle the communication at the edge the um, communication coming in from um, outside of your environment. Um, Envoy Proxy is a popular cloud native proxy that's um, been built for, uh, that's popular with distributed environments. Um, this is, uh, we, and the way that we have built it is that, so it can be highly uh, performant and scalable. Our, the data plane um, with Envoy is separated from the control plane so that you can scale them independently based on the needs of the application. Um, it is designed to um, route traffic into a variety of application services, whether they be monoliths, microservices, or serverless, make, making it ideal to help um, incrementally mic uh, modernize your environment to more uh, cloud native architecture. And this works on um, cloud and on-premise environments. Glue is available open source and enterprise. Um, the, as you can see here, this, the items in the um, light blue are in the, are the enterprise functionality. Um, the open source, uh, open source Glue has um, lots of robust features from um, networking and um, custom security uh, capabilities that you can um, work on. And then from an enterprise side, we add additional functionality for security and management, specifically to help in scaling out the environment across multiple clusters, multiple environments, um, add more enterprise security um, integrations to things like authentication systems, um, and also have um, like developer portal access to expose APIs externally. And Glue is used across uh, many different companies, um, specifically to handle their edge communication from you know, small startups to large enterprises um, to help them modernize their environment. And with that, I'd like to hand it over to Kevin, who's gonna give a little deeper dive into what's new with the latest release. Sure, thanks Betty for the uh, introduction. Um, Kevin here, very excited to have so many of you joining us today. Um, so for what's new in Glue, um, so many things, we're really just covering a highlight here. We've done uh, tons of new feature work, user experience improvements, enhancements, and uh, some bug fixes as well. 
Um, but some of the highlights here, we can, we can talk about them and then we'll, we'll do a quick demo. Um, so Glue, first off, uh, Glue Federation updates for uh, multi-cluster failover. Glue Federation uh, built on top of Glue to run multiple clusters and, and multi-Glue. Um, and we've added some enhancements there with related to multi-cluster failover and DNS, which we'll talk about later. Uh, we have traffic routing and route table enhancements. So our route table API, uh, which we have you know, created to help separate uh, like routing configuration from you know, virtual service owners and allow maybe platform teams to control the routing to their individual services without having to control. Um, I see a question coming in. We can talk about those at the end. Uh, so it'll separate your platform team's routing configuration from like any glue admins. Um, we've added some enhancements there to support more flexible route table matchers. So uh, before you had restrictions on the kinds of prefix matchers and uh, now you can do other things with query and method matchers. Um, talk about that further. Uh, we have expanded configuration options in Glue and Envoy. Um, some validation API enhancements. So handling lists, uh, large lists of proposed resources much better. Um, so user experience improvements as well. Uh, security enhancements to external auth. We have added new features like uh, access token validation, where you do only partial legs of the OIDC flow. It improves some security there with respect to the cookies and ID tokens returned. Um, automated some routing the developer portal, which uh, Marco, I'm sure we'll talk about, uh, and some developer portal, single sign-on, and customization options as well. Jump to the next slide. Great. So for Glue Federation, um, this again, this is multi built, you know, product built on top of Glue, multi-cluster, multi-Glue. Um, some of the new improvements here are DNS resolution for failover to endpoints. Um, we have Helm chart values for proxy config, secrets for downstream SSL. Uh, optional node ports, a better uh, bootstrap demo, uh, detect and register on register clusters. Uh, over here on the left, you can see our little diagram of, of Glue Federation and how it might work. So here we have two clusters, a cluster on the left here with one Glue installation, a cluster on the right with another Glue installation, um, each running you know, the Envoy's ingress. If for whatever reason, service foo and cluster one failed health checks, you could do failover to service foo in another cluster. Um, with, with Glue Federation. Uh, so the, and this is the, the one that we'll be demoing as well. Uh, I know it's not a lot of text here, but uh, we've, we've added new feature uh, functionality to Glue for uh, more flexible gRPC to JSON uh, transcoding. So um, you, you're behind the scenes after, uh, behind your API gateway behind Glue, you might want to run a bunch of gRPC microservices, but then expose that outside the cluster as an HTTP REST service. Um, we've had similar functionality uh, in Glue before, but it was very, it was inflexible. It didn't allow a lot of customization options. So we've, we've created a more flexible way of doing uh, something similar. Uh, we've exposed the, the, you know, the more raw Envoy API. Uh, the demonstration demo later will make this a little bit clearer exactly how this works. And then uh, like we had mentioned before, uh, we have some route table enhancements. Uh, so route tables, again, uh, separate the virtual service and actual routing config. So you could have Glue admins control the virtual service while, you know, application developers and owners can own the routes to their actual applications. Um, again, prior, you had to have the prefix matchers match all the way, and you couldn't have anything other than a prefix matcher, like naked or raw, uh, as a parent of a route table. But we've added uh, support for complex matchers. So you can do headers, query parameters, and methods. Um, any children will have to have be a superset of the parents' uh, headers, query parameters, or methods, um, as well as some improvements to uh, reporting errors on route tables, user experience improvements. Uh, another thing, uh, bigger change for Glue is we've added the new rate limit config CRD. So Glue has had rate limiting uh, similar to XDOF, uh, in for a while now. Um, before you had to define all of your rate limit settings uh, configuration in line on the settings resource. So, uh, if, and as well, you also had to define them in line on your virtual services. Uh, we had similar problems or, you know, a similar problem we want to tackle in the past is with external authentication and the auth config CRD. We did a very similar thing here with the rate li limit config CRD. So now you can, configure your rate limits in a single CRD and then reference them from your virtual services. Um, 
this provides flexibility for reusing config. It's, it allows you to sort of templatize config, um, which should improve the user experience of deploying Glue uh, and operationalize it much more easily. Uh, and then for the validation API, uh, we had a couple of improvements here. So for example, list handling, uh, allowing you to propose a, a, you know, a long list of resources rather than one at a time and validate them all together, uh, as well as uh, supporting dry runs. So when you hit the validation service, it will do some internal caching and then your next proposed resource might have uh, applied the resource in memory, uh, but we allow for dry runs to control that behavior, as well as uh, returning, you know, the, if, the, if you propose a list of resources or not a list of resources to our validation API, um, this is for validating config that you would propose like virtual services, route tables, gateways um, to, to Glue to make sure that they are valid before you apply them to your cluster. Uh, we can take those and translate them and return the proxy that would have been generated, um, which can be useful for, for diffing between, um, you know, in CI CD setups that are built into the validation API. Um, as well as for user experience supporting YAML admission requests as well, which will be a little more human readable and familiar if you're using Kubernetes. Uh, and with that, we can jump into a quick demo. I'll take over the screen share and we can show you a little bit about the uh, gRPC to JSON transcoding. Okay, oops. So can everyone see my screen here? I believe so. We've got yes, this demo terminal. Good. Fantastic. So here, uh, I've got a couple of files here. Uh, I've got it completely, you know, empty and naked. The first thing we're gonna do is set up uh, our kind cluster. So uh, this is what we're going to do. Just moving this out of the way. Uh, so we're gonna create a new kind cluster, kind being Kubernetes and Docker, if you're not familiar. So create a local cluster, kind of like Minikube. Uh, I'm just adding these extra settings to expose these ports uh, on the local host so we can hit these later at the end of the demo. This will make a little more sense. This is just um, boilerplate that makes it uh, easier to run glue and kind on a local machine. It's, it's really just a demo. Uh, so with that, we'll create the cluster demo. Um, again, we're just exposing ports 31500 and 32500, if I remember correctly, uh, to local host. And then from here, we can go ahead and install Glue. And we'll look at the bookstore service. So this is the gRPC service we're going to be working with um, and exposing as a REST API locally, uh, even though it's a, a gRP service itself. So there we have our Kubernetes cluster live. I'll stop using shorthand, kubectl get pods. We can see that uh, my kubectl Kubernetes context is set up properly. We've installed Kubernetes. They've got the controller manager, record DNS, and the like. Uh, so from here, we'll install the gateway. Um, so GlueCTL install gateway. We're installing version 1.5. We're showing off new functionality added in Glue 1.5. And uh, similarly, I'll show you the values. These are some Helm values overrides for this particular for this installation. So these Helm values, when we take a look at these, are, are really just going to match the, the cluster configuration that we had for Kind itself. We created the Kind cluster and exposed ports. Um, these are used to make sure that the services that expose our, our ingress match those ports. Ah, I see. So it finished. So if we are doing pods and glue system, we should see that we have our Envoy, Gateway Proxy, the gateway, glue itself, serving XDS config, and discovery, uh, discovering upstreams for us. So the values that I installed with here just tell us to do a node port service type on the on the envoy and to use the same ports that we uh, defined in kind to expose them on localhost. Just demo setup. You wouldn't do this in a real, real environment. And so the effect of this is that if you were to get the service. Um, it makes sure that the gateway proxy service envoy is exposed on those ports instead of just picking any arbitrary open ones. Um, so moving from there, we've got our cluster set up, we've installed Glue. Um, now we can take a look at the bookstore gRPC service. 
So here in the bookstore, we have, um, I'm gonna remove the descriptors. This was not cleaned up from prior. So here, the, the relevant things are, let's start with the, uh, the bookstore proto. This is the API that our gRPC service uh, is implementing. So nothing too complex here. Um, we have our, our GRP service um, with you know RPCs. We can list shelves, uh, get the response, which is just a list of shelves, create shelves. Um, it's just a, a library, a bookstore. Uh, the, the important or, or relevant thing here is that we're taking advantage of the Google API uh, HTTP transcoding annotations in our proto. So here we're defining, uh, when, I, when I make this gRPC call and I want to map uh, an HTTP call in this way, uh, and then Envoy can take, will be able to take care of this with glue in 1.5. Uh, so for here, we're saying if someone were making an HTTP REST call with the path dash shelves, we'll return the list shelves response. Um, which is just a list of shelves. And then similarly, if we want to create a shelf, if, the, if someone posts, makes an HTTP post request on the path slash shelf, then take the request body and put it uh, like under shelf, into a shelf. Um, similarly, we can take a look briefly at the, uh, the server code. But here is really quite simple. Um, we implement the bookstore server, we implement you know, list shelves, create shelf. Um, this is just, again, standard gRPC service. So what we need to do here to expose this as a, a REST API in Glue is we need to uh, generate proto descriptors that Envoy can then use uh, to decode uh, HTTP calls and then put, turn them into the appropriate gRPC uh, information. So we've got it built into here, um, in I believe main.go, we have our, in our go generate, we can descript, generate our proto descriptors using this call. So here we're going to uh, create the descriptors proto, you know, dot PV, the binary for decoding those HTTP REST calls. Um, so the, the command that we need to do, um, I'll just run this real quickly and I'll explain what it's doing. So first we're going to uh, change into temp directory and clone protobuf and Google APIs. These are the, uh, these are necessary source for generating the correct protobuf. Um, and then we're going to export the, the location of where these are stored and then change directories back to where we are and run go generate. So we're really just doing some setup, running go generate. Um, this is specific to the demo, but we just need to generate this uh, descriptors file, this, this set, created this descriptors directory. And there's this descriptors protobuf. And this is the binary that we need to provide for Envoy. Uh, so again, we've, we've cloned the protobuf directory, the Google APIs directory, and then set the locations here, and then run go generate from the current directory where we are right now. And this go generate ran this proto C command that took use of Google protos home, protobuf home, including the source information from these repos that we cloned. And then we're outputting it as these protobuf descriptors. This, this is gonna turn into binary we can send to Envoy. So another thing that we have here is um, these are descriptors for the service, but we need to actually deploy the service to our cluster. So if we want to take a look at bookstore.yaml, this is just a simple deployment and service that deploys the bookstore, the gRPC service. Um, nothing too fancy here, just applying this. This is the source code for the service that we're going to be applying. So just as a reminder, we've, you know, now applied the service. So we should see, we still have Glue installed. If we look in default, we should now see the bookstore. Uh, similarly, because we have Glue's discovery service running, we should now have an upstream discovered for that uh, service, Glue system. So we now have the bookstore service. Well, this was created 28 seconds ago when I deployed the bookstore service. Um, now we can apply, uh, moving back down, we're going to actually route to the service. So the steps we've 
uh, looked at the source code, generated a scripter for doing the trans transcoding from gRPC uh, to REST. Uh, we've installed Glue. We've got the bookstore upstream running. Uh, so now we just need to create a way to route to it. Uh, so first we can apply the, uh, the virtual service and let's take a look at what this is. Simply this virtual service, uh, we're just taking requests at foodexample.com, matching everything and sending it to the bookstore. We're not doing anything fancy here. Uh, so the only other thing we need to do now is update the gateway. So to enable the, this gRPC transcoding in the gateway, this is what we're going to be applying. Uh, the only real changes here are these. So here we're going to apply options for the gRPC JSON transcoder, which was added in Glue 1.5. Uh, we're working with the main.bookstore server package and then uh, of this bookstore service. Uh, and then we need to include protodescriptor bin. So this is the binary for the protodescriptor. Uh, this will be very long and I'll, uh, we're about to get this and fill this in and that's all we need to do. Um, so let's, let's do that, but if when it's very long and we could do this as a file instead. Uh, so to get that binary, we need to, uh, let's see, go to the bookstore. Again, the binary is, is in this file that we generate from descriptors with proto-c. So if I want to take a look at this, we can look at the file and put it into base64. This would just be binary, very, very big, like we might've seen before um begins with the same couple characters crt i'm not going to keep scrolling up um instead we can just put it on our clipboard and update the uh the gateway so here we have this is the configuration we want to add we're just going to fill in the rest of this from the uh from a clipboard And now if we just apply, kubectl apply the gateway, then we should be in business. We have configured our gateway to you do the gRPC transcoding. We've configured our virtual service to route to an upstream that's been discovered. We've applied the bookstore. Um, so we should be able to route now. Uh, if we want to get a list of shelves, we're looking here, we can make a request to foo.example.com matching our virtual service at localhost localhost is working because we've set up this port forwarding on 31500 when we installed glue and uh, set up kind. Uh, so now it knows how to handle this rest request to our gRPC service. Similarly, if we wanted to add a shelf, we could uh, then provide the post request uh, with the proper body and we've added a new book sh a shelf uh, to our bookshelf and then we can re retrieve it. Um, so here's a little, quick little demo of the, the advanced GRPC transcoding. This gives you a lot more flexibility um, than the sort of auto-discovering that we had before in Glue and allows you to do more uh, flexible things like, uh, you know, instead of providing this is the body, you can grab it from query parameters and, and all of the other options that the Google HTTP transcoding, uh, you know, protobuf options allow. Um, with that, I can uh, hand it off to Marco. Okay. Or oh, we had to share. Betty, can you share your screen again? Oh, I think I think I can share the slides on my side. The ones yeah, that that would be great, Marco. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Kevin. And yeah, thanks everyone for joining. I am going to share my screen. Can you see the screen? Yes. Looks great. Okay. Perfect. So I'm going to talk about the updates that we uh, applied to the developer portal for Glue. And so just a quick history here. The first version of the developer portal that we released uh, was at, at the end of March. Uh, and since then, we've uh, added a lot of new features. The first version was mainly focused on publishing open API specifications to a portal application that we could um, automatically generate for you and expose some simple customizations to uh, adapt the look and feel of the portal to your organizational needs. 
with the most recent version of the developer portal that we released together with Glue 1.5, uh, we made several changes uh, to both of these aspects. So on one hand, we enhanced the API to give you uh, more freedom in deciding how you want to structure the APIs that you want to expose to your users and also which policies you want to apply to the APIs that you expose to whoever wants to consume them. And also we expanded the possibilities of how you can customize the look and feel of the portals that your users will log into to consume your APIs. In particular, and we'll see this like in a demo shortly, I want to just um, go through the, the highlights here. Um, we now allow users to provide their own CSS style sheets to customize the, um, the styling of the portal. And uh, we also added support for adding dynamic pages to the portal. We, the portal already supported adding static markdown content. What we did um, with the latest release is allowing you to embed your own application into the portal and to access the context of the portal to display whatever, you know, to implement whatever behavior you need um, for your particular use case. And Another core new feature is that we now allow um, you to integrate with your OpenID Connect provider to authenticate users to the portal. So in, in the first iteration of the portal, we relied on uh, you creating your users as custom resources in your cluster. And uh, we implemented a basic authentication mechanism so that you could match some credentials to a particular CRD. Now this is, okay for some simple use cases, but most organizations uh, have a dedicated service that manages their identities. And most likely that service implements OAuth 2.0, and it's very likely that that service is also an OpenID Connect identity provider. So what we did is we built the integration points so that you can use the identity stored in your OpenID Connect identity provider to authenticate users in your portal. And yeah, so this is, was the quick overview um, of the new features. One thing I also want to mention is that while the first iteration of the developer portal uh, required you to write the gateway configuration that matches the open API definitions that you upload into the portal, the new developer portal that was released with Glue 1.5 is now able to automatically generate the virtual services, rate limit configurations, authentication configuration for your APIs, exposing a much simpler and higher level API. So you do not need to maintain the resources yourself. You have a single source of truth, which is the document that describes your API itself, and you can drive both the gateway configuration and the documentation that you expose to your end users with this single object. So you have a single source of truth for both these um, information. Okay, so, oops, sorry. Without further ado, now I'm going to jump right into the demo and a lot of these, this will make more sense. So I have a cluster running and I have a Glue Enterprise installed. So you can see that um, I have all the pods are running, so the developer portal is an enterprise only feature. And it consists, I have the developer portal installed here as well. It consists of two pods. So one, the dev portal pod is just the controller that processes the, the resources um, that make up, that configure the developer portal and also implements the web server that serves the portal applications. The admin server is what backs the admin UI. And as you can see here, like for this like simple demo, I just port forwarded the admin server pod. And um, this is what the landing page of the UI looks like. Now I want to start by showing how the new API allows greater flexibility and new features uh, for you like, when you want to expose your APIs. So the starting point for an API is an API doc. And an API doc is 
a concept you might be familiar with if you use the, the first version of the developer portal. It's just an open API specification that describes your service. Now I have some files here that I can ready to use. So oh, I also want to mention that I have uh, a simple service deployed to my default namespace. So it's the pet store service that we use for a lot of demos. And here I'm going to upload the open API specification that describes that service. So I can upload it into the UI and basically start building the catalog of all the services that you have running in your backend. And you can see that the system was able to parse the open API specification, derive information from it. So you can see the different operations, the paths and the methods associated with, uh, with these operations. Now, an API doc is a description of the structure of a service. What is missing from an open API doc and uh, a piece of information we might want to provide separately is where should, where does the service live? Where do you want to route the traffic to? And you could have the same definition of an API doc. Uh, you could have an API definition, and but you want to send the service, the traffic to a, a service in the development environment in one case, but you want to send the same traffic uh, to a production service in, in your production environment. So you have this one to many relationship between backends and API definitions. So a, a missing piece, the second piece that we need to actually generate the configuration and complete the API definition is what we call a route. So a route is really just um, a routing destination for traffic. So here you can see that I'm going to add a simple route to my pet store service. Uh, you could do traffic splits, you can do header manipulations. There, there are different advanced configurations, but for our use case, we just want to send uh, basically to, to represent our Kubernetes service. So now that I have both of these objects in place, I can create what we call an API product. And an API product is the central object that drives uh, both, that, that can be published to portal and that drives the configuration of uh, your Glue API gateway. So I'm going to call this API product pet store. I need to fill out the required fields. I need to associate the domain with the API product. This is the domain that the users will be able to query it. So I provision some DNS um, records here that, that map to my Glue um, gateway proxy. You can upload an image. We'll see later that this will be shown in the portal UI. And then you can select the operations that you want to expose uh, on your API product. So this is a level of indirection between what your actual APIs are and what you want to expose to your consumers. Um, I have only one API doc here, so I can only choose between the operations on that one API doc, but if I had more than one, I could basically just choose the operations that I want to be exposed in this API product. So let's say that I want to only uh, select read operations, so the two get endpoints, I can select only those. I'm going to create an API product. And now you can see that all the information that I've inputted is available here. And what I need to do is I need to specify the route that, um, that is going to apply to this API product. You can specify a default route for the whole object, or you can specify different routes for different operations. In this case, I'm gonna keep it simple and just set a default route. Now that I have all objects, you can see that the status is green and um, we have our API definition. Now, as I mentioned earlier, we can use this object to actually generate configuration for the glue gateway. So, uh, you can see that I don't have any virtual services. And if I flip the switch here, this will instruct the developer portal to actually generate a routing configuration for the gateway. So now if I come to this screen, you can see that the developer portal generated uh, a virtual service for my domain with all the operations that uh, I defined in my API product. And so we basically were able to ensure that uh, all the routing rules are in place 
to route to my service based on my service definition and some simple uh, customization that I can apply to this API product object. Now, this is only one part of what the developer portal does. So generate a configuration for Glue exposing this high level API. I want also to show um, how like the new portal features that I mentioned earlier. So to that end, I'm going to create a pet store portal and I need to provide a domain here as well. This is the domain users will reach uh, the API um, will will reach to open the portal. Um, I can provide some customizing information, like I can customize the background, I can customize the logo. You might be familiar with this, but I'm gonna fill this information out just for whoever is seeing this for the first time. And here I can decide to publish my, uh, to publish my API to the portal. And I'm just gonna click through here. And here we go. So now you, if we, oops, I need to, I don't think, yes, I need to enable ingress to my router. So similarly, um, we can generate a virtual service to expose your um, portal application. So now that I flip the switch, um, we can see that we have a portal um, virtual service. And if I go to this address, we should be able to see that uh, the dev portal was able to generate this web application dynamically using all the information that I provided. Now, the, in the first iteration, we were only of the developer portal, we were only able to set some primary and secondary colors and just the logo and fab icon and the background. So what I mentioned earlier is that now we allow you to um, provide your own CSS. So let's say that, for example, you want to modify the color of the title of the portal. So what I can do is I can inspect the page to find what CSS class is associated with that element. And by opening this advanced portal customization dialog, I can provide some custom CSS for that element. So for example, let's just say that I, I want to make the color of the text orange. So if I save this, I come back here, you'll see that the text is now orange. And you can, using this mechanism, you can really modify any element present on the portal. You can provide your own style sheet to change not only you know, the color, but also the spacing and you know, whatever you can control via CSS, which is uh, a lot. So the other new feature I mentioned is the ability to define um, dynamic pages. So what we had in the first version of the developer portal was the ability to define static content. So I'm going to create a static page here. And this is basically just markdown. So you can define your page and then add some markdown content. See the typos. And this would generate an additional section in the UI where you can visualize whatever content you defined in the static page, which could be a static some instructions to get started or whatever other documentation you want to provide. And the new feature that was released with the latest version is the ability to actually define dynamic pages. And as I said, dynamic pages are really applications that we render inside the portal. So to this end, I wrote a very simple um, HTML file, which consists of just a body and a script that um, accesses the context of the portal to display the currently logged in user and uh, the API product that the user has access to. So um, I'm going to upload this file. You can also just provide a URL to the, to the entry point of your application. So it doesn't have to be just a simple uh, HTML file. It can really be you know, a React app and you just have to provide the address of the index HTML file that is an entry point to that app. So I'm going to add some information here, dynamic page, and 
hopefully, yes, it, it's available. Now I'm not logged in, so this will show nothing right now um, because the user is not logged in. But this is just to show that uh, we're able to display that, that page. And now once, once we're, we'll be able to log in, I can show you that we can show the information associated with the user and what the user has access to. So uh, this leads me to the next feature that I want to show, which is the OIDC authentication for the portal. So as I mentioned, we can integrate with a server and we can do that by providing some information. So I'm going to use Google as an identity provider. So I have set up my, the developer portal as uh, a client for our solo IO application, uh, sorry, um, solo IO organization. So I'm going to use Google as an issuer. I have a client ID here um, that I registered with Google. Um, I, I have a client secret that I have provisioned here in the cluster. So you can see that we have a portal OIDC secret. This contains the client secret that the developer portal is going to use to authenticate with the Google uh, OpenID Connect identity provider. So my secret is in the default namespace. The key that stores the data is with client secrets. I need to provide a prefix that will be used by Google to call back to the portal. In this case, it is just a URL of our portal. And I need to tell the system which claim in the ID token that we will receive when a user successfully logs in contains uh, the groups that the user is a member of. That's how we model the permissions, and as I'll show you in a second. So to keep it simple, I, I'm just going to use the hosted domain name, which is uh, will always be solo.io in my case. And as um, as the the element in the ID token, the claim in the ID token that contains the group membership information. Most likely, in a in a real world use case, you'll have an actual groups claim which consists of a list of groups. So once I have enabled this configuration, I need to actually go and create the second half of what we need to uh, allow OEC access, which is the name, which is an OEC group. So we model permissions at the group level in the system, and then we create a mapping between the ID token and the group. So I'm going to you call this um, whatever solo users. And I need to provide the name of the group as it will appear in the ID token. So uh, on the portal page, we configured which token to inspect for the group membership information. And here we need to specify what the name of the group as it appears in the token will be. So whenever we receive an ID token, which has uh, a hosted domain of which a value of solo IO, we will consider that ID token part of this um, of this of, of this uh, you know group, so we give the group access to our API. We don't have any usage plans. I'll show that shortly if I have time. And we're going to give the group access to our portal. And now, once everything is in place, we should be ready to go. So, if I click on the login button here, I can select to log in with OpenID Connect, and you see I'm redirected to the OpenID Connect provider, so Google in this case, I need to input my credentials. And I am using two factor authentication. So I need to use my phone to allow myself to log in. And as you can see, now I am logged into the portal. And if I come back to the dynamic page, oops, wait, let me refresh. Okay, this is, I would have expected this to actually show the information. Okay, uh, I don't know what the, why that didn't refresh immediately, but now you can see that the dynamic page, so the script that I created here, has actually access to the current user and to the APIs that this user has access to. This is just to show how you can use information that are in the portal context in your own application to implement whatever behavior you want. So if I have enough time, I think I might have a minute. I want to show another feature real quick. So I haven't really showed how you can really um, 
use the API. So you remember that when you enable the switch here, oops, uh, we created a virtual service. And um, if I try to curl the domain for our API, you can see that we actually get back a response from our service. So in most cases, you will not want to have your service just publicly uh, exposed, but you want to secure it. So we have this concept that we introduced with the new API of a usage plan. And a usage plan is a set of, it's basically an authentication policy and a rate limit policy. So you can create um, a usage plan. Um, in this case, uh, we're using API keys as an authentication mechanism. And we're going to define a rate limit of three requests per minute for users of this basic plan. You can have multiple access plans on this portal. So now access will be secured. So if I, oops, uh, if I try to query the API again, you'll see that uh, it, the access is now, um, I'm getting a 403 error because I'm not logged in. So what can I do as a user to provision credentials for this API? So first as an administrator, I need to update the group. So, oh, no. so it has access to the basic plan we just created. And now once I, am, I have that permission, I can access uh, the authentication section of my profile and I can request an API key for the basic plan for the pet store application. So the system is, able to automatically generate a configuration so that this API key is valid. And if I now um, go to my API, which is available here in the API section of my portal, and I, well, first let's show again that if I try it out, you will get a for, uh, an unauthorized error. And if I use my API key here to and send it along with a request, you'll see that now I get a 200. And after three requests, two, three, on the fourth one, I get a 429 error because I've been rate limited according to the usage plan that is linked to my user. So just to recap, so what I showed here is how you can configure OpenID Connect to as a source of identity information for users for the developer portal. I showed how you can customize the look and feel of your portal using custom CSS, implement custom behavior using dynamic pages and how you can add authentication and rate limit policies to your APIs via the usage plan abstraction. And this is really everything I have. So with that, I'm, I'm happy to hand it back to Betty for the QA. Yeah, Marco, could you actually just share yeah. that last slide? Yes. Um, and then we have a couple of questions here specifically um, following your demo. Um, could you have multiple OIDC providers integrated into the um, uh, portal flow? Or is it just one? So it, it is one per portal. So each portal application could use a different one, but currently you can have only one for a portal application. Great. Um, and then there was... Um, do we support um, import API... Uh, in an open API format or Swagger, um, how do you define the catalog categories for the APIs? So we support open API specifically, open API as a uh, format um, for the specification of your API. So you can import your open API documents into uh, the system and those become the, basically your API catalog. And then you can choose how to expose those APIs to the API products. You could have a one-to-one -one mapping. So if you just want to expose a whole open API document, you can just select only that one, or you could merge two open API documents together. Um, but we already support importing your open API definitions in the system. Um, as I showed in the beginning, I can, I can show what the open API document that I uploaded looks like. So you can see it's a JSON formatted open API specification. So it's, it's, it's a standard format and we can just import it in the system and the system will be able to interpret it. I, I hope this answers the question. Yeah, if, there, if you need more clarification, please go ahead and type it into the um, chat or Q&A. Um, there was a question here on rate limiting. Um, you know, we have basic rate limiting um, available in open source and then rate limiting um, in the enterprise edition as well. 
Kevin, could you explain a little bit on the difference uh, in how users can um, use rate limiting in those different editions? In open source and enterprise? Mm -hmm. Sure. So in open source, we expose the, the Envoy rate limit filter, which allows you to configure uh, Envoy to look towards any gRPC service that implements the Envoy rate limit API to make rate limiting decisions. So the, the simple explanation there is that in open source, you can provide your own implementation of the Envoy gRPC service, service and then use that with Glue. Um, so in enterprise, the, the add-on there is that we have our own implementation of the uh, gRPC Envoy rate limit service that has uh, functionality built in with the ZRDs and inline config, um, you know, very much so based on the, the Envoy implementation, but with add-ons on top for like weights, rules, um, where we're doing some new work right now with respect to handling uh, sets rather than rate limit trees uh, for configuration. Um, but basically either you can use our implementation or provide your own um, is enterprise versus open source. And we had some recent, um, in the recent release, we had some enhancements um, for rate limiting as well, right? Yes, that's correct um, with respect to the rate limit CRDs. Um, yep. Great. Uh, and looks like one more question and another question here on how does the um, API product object work with CRDs? So, yeah, that's, that's a good question. Something I forgot to mention is all the objects that I, um, that I just demoed uh, are Kubernetes CRDs. So, well, here there's a bunch of them, but if you look at the web portal ones, so users, routes, portals, groups, API products, API docs, all of these are CRDs. So everything you see, you saw me doing through the UI, you can actually do declaratively via YAML. So if I try to um, look for API products, you can see that the API product is just defined via the UI is an actual CRD. So um, the spec part is what you would specify if you wanted to write this in the command line. And you can see this, this contains all the information that I, um, that I set through the UI. So the source of the API is an API doc. And these are the operations that I selected. This is the default route for the service. This is some display information. These are the domains, the usage plans. So everything in the system is modeled as a CRD. So you can uh, describe your whole developer portal through YAML files that you can integrate in your GitOps workflow and basically provision all these resources without ever using the admin dashboard like I just did. And that actually is um, one of the things when you look at um, how Glue and um, you know the portal and Glue Federation, um, the various capabilities, is that we've architected around to be Kubernetes native and be driven by CRD, um, CRDs versus um, you know some of the and using Envoy proxy as the proxy um, inside of the gateway. Compare, and that's a point of comparison against kind of. Uh, many other, if you look at the landscape of, you know, API management um, vendors. So uh, one is, you know, cloud native. Um, so looking at, you know, being Kubernetes native, using um, Kubernetes architecture and some of the things that uh, Marco just talked about on how to drive configurations and designed to ha um, handle distributed environments in a very um, highly performant and scalable way. Um, so hopefully I saw some questions um, asking about like, you know, differences between Glue to like other API management providers. So that's at a high level, um, those are kind of the big points. Um, and then if you have further, further questions on that, um, hit us up on Slack, just join uh, slack.solo.io. And I think um, it's, it's, it's a better kind of one-on-one -on -one discussion based on the use cases and the application environments you're trying to um, set up. So um, we are just about out of time. So I want to thank Kevin and Marco for today's presentation and the demos. Um, for the folks that joined today, thank you for joining. Um, we have some links here so you can go learn more about Glue, um, Glue Open Source and Enterprise. If you're interested in getting involved in um, the open source site, we have a link to the repo there. Uh, join the community, the Slack community. We've got lots of other um, end users in there as well as our engineers in there answering questions um, and links to the blog post to um, get the full list of uh, uh, functionality that we released in the 1.5 release. And if you would like to get hands-on 
with Glue on October 29th, we are hosting a live online workshop. It'll be done all virtual, um, but we have um, environments set up and then you'll actually be able to go through many of these um, workflows on routing, security, et cetera, for Glue. Um, we've got uh, space is limited, but we still have some more seats available for, um, we're doing one session in European time and one session um, for uh, US time, like Pacific time, 10 a.m. And with that, we will see you all next time. Thank you very much for joining. Bye.